Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inspire Your Students by Communicating with Passion. This is a Simulive session, so I will be available throughout the session to talk to you in the chat. My name is Jessica Haxey, and I am Supervisor of World Languages for New Haven Public Schools in Connecticut. I'm also ACTFL President-Elect. Let's get started. You'll find a handout for this session at this tiny URL, and I've also uploaded it to the ACTFL site. The tiny URL is tinyurl.com backslash ACTFL Passion 2020. If you go there, you'll see that uh, you could make a copy of this document and type into it, or you could print it and make notes during the session. And in addition, I'll make reference to certain puzzle pieces and have the fact that I've linked documents that give you more information about each of those topics to the puzzle piece above it. So if you click on the puzzle piece and then click on the link, it will go to an article or another resource about that topic. All right, first let's pause for a minute and think about three questions. And there's space to write about these on your handout. Why did you become a world language teacher? Why do you love the language and culture that you teach? Was it a wonderful experience in the past? Was it a travel experience? Are you a heritage or native speaker? Why do you believe that language learning in general is important? Take a moment to jot down your answers. Now let's think about how do we communicate our passion for our languages and for language learning to our students so that those things that you've just written down on your paper, how do we communicate that and show that to students every day by the way that we teach? And how do we help students to love this language and language learning in general by what they experience from us and in our classes? Today, I hope to address these two questions with you. At this point in the presentation, we would do a live Japanese demonstration class and I would ask you to pretend you are my students, um, but unfortunately we can't be live together today. And I really wish we could because I do enjoy the interaction of a live session. But since we can't, uh, we'll take a little walk back in time to probably about 15 years ago uh, when I was teaching a demonstration class uh, in Iowa at the National Foreign Language Resource Center. And these are some elementary students who've had Japanese for about four days and we're doing a unit on the produce stand. And by the end of this unit, they'll be able to talk about uh, their fruits and vegetables and their likes and dislikes. And they do some buying and selling from each other in which they make requests, uh, ask how much things are, ask to buy things, thank each other. Uh, and um, this lesson that you're about to see is actually just a science context lesson in which I'm trying to give them many more opportunities to hear the fruit and vegetable words in an interesting context. So while the context is the science of sinking or floating, whether these fruits and vegetables sink or float, we don't really get into the actual science behind it, which is actually pretty complicated. Um, but what I'm doing is using it as another context for them to hear uh, the words, the vocabulary that we're working on and for them to hear me speaking all in the target language uh, in, a context, in a context that has a lot of meaning for them. While you watch this lesson, what I'd like you to look for is what about the way I'm teaching or the things that I do communicates to students that I am passionate about Japanese and about their language learning. One note, at one po point, I move a little bit to the side of the screen because I'm getting a, um, a bar of soap, a metal peeler, and a scrubber brush. And these are the things that I pretend to wash the fruit with, but those are also the things that I use to introduce the terms sink and float because the soap floats, the peeler sinks, and then the um, scrubber brush floats a little bit. So let's watch a little bit of this together and you have a spot in your handout to take notes. This 
I'm sure as it did for me, you will find it makes you um, a little bit sad and thinking about what it's like when you can be clo in close quarters with students. But we will continue throughout this presentation to talk about how important all of the, these things are, uh, even in this time of remote teaching or hybrid teaching that I know a lot of us are involved in. Let's take a look. So stand and go. Oh, orange, 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 orange,
시즈면. 시즈면. 우리가 캣가네. 시즈면. 네. 타와시. 타와시. 와. 으그. 시즈면. 으그. 요네. 으그. 오케이. 이마카라 좀더 예스 시대미마쇼. 에, 또 이지만 사이쇼와 나시. 나시와 우크 시즘. 시즘. 오케이. 예스. 맞대, 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 맞대. 예스 시대미도 피. 코리가 예스 나도고로. 따라 시즘 나도고로. 코코니 하이티 크라사. 오케이. 코코니 하이티 크라사 이마카라. I want. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you probably noticed that toward the end there, I fast forwarded through all of the other guesses that they did on the other fruits and vegetables so that you could see what their reactions are like uh, when they uh, saw what the banana did. Uh, that was, you only got to see that one. And then we, after that, we went through all of the others and their reaction was very similar, um, especially if they got the guess correct. So uh, feel free now, uh, if you're SimuLive here with me to go ahead and put in the chat. Uh, the types of things that you noticed that might communicate um, my passion for Japanese and my passion for wanting them to learn Japanese during that lesson. Uh, I'm going to take just one breath and pause and then I'm going to tell you some of the things in case you're not SimuLive um, that I might think you would be putting in the chat. So some of the things that I noticed when I watched that and uh, is that you know the, the lesson moves at a fairly quick pace. So I had everything ready to go. I mean, it was a demonstration lesson, so I knew people were watching and it was being filmed. So that's uh, not necessarily how perfectly everything goes every day, but um, everything was ready to go. I had the handouts ready. I had the water ready. I had everything there. I had a towel there so that there was no uh, lag time. Uh, and I, for students to, you know, get off task or feel that this wasn't just the most important thing I was doing at that moment. Um, you may have also noticed that I used humor quite a bit. I use my face a lot. I make a lot of faces. Uh, at one point, the students um, thought it was funny that they got a little bit wet in the front uh, when I when I picked up the water. And so I flung my fingers on them because I happened to hear the students say that. And once I did that, everyone really um, got engaged and, and laughed. Um, so I'm, I try to be very present and like 100% there with the students so that I can hear little comments like that and respond to them. And that's really my sort of me trying to be sort of my authentic self with them. It was also a fairly authentic context, even though, you know, sinking and floating things is not an everyday thing that might happen. And certainly the words sink and float are not words that I was expecting them to remember. I did try to make it somewhat in a context in that I pretended I was washing the apple and that was the reason that I needed to start. And then after that though, something like where you're doing predicting and finding out the answer is certainly something you can do in language classes, whether it be in Kahoot uh, online or whether it be uh, some kind of fun PowerPoint game or Jeopardy game that you're playing. Um, and also in an elementary setting, a sink or float lesson would be in a predicting and hypothesizing type thing would be quite appropriate. 
Uh, I also try to be very nurturing with the way I interact with students. So every single student was could hear me give the choice, do you want um, green crayon or black crayon? I said it every single time so everyone could answer and no one felt as if they had to remember what I'd said a few minutes ago. I do a lot of modeling with the clipboard and with my gestures so that everyone can feel successful um, and sort of nurtured and coached uh, through the language learning. And I do try to teach with somewhat of an intensity where they really feel that I'm in uh, moving us forward and in that moment and that everything we're doing right now is important. So, so those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And these are the things that I think communicate to students your passion and excite them to the extent that it engenders passion in them. So, of course, in order to remember these things, we're going to use passion as our acronym. So let's talk about what the acronym stands for now. Oh, or is it mnemonic? Maybe it's mnemonic. Uh, we're going to talk about what it stands for now, and then we'll uh, go back and talk about each one one by one. So P is for pace, A is for authenticity, S is for self-awareness, the other S is for self-care, I is for intensity, O is for openness, N is for nurturing, and then there's one more big puzzle piece that goes right in the middle. And I'm not going to tell you what that stands for yet, but as we go throughout the presentation, I'd like you to think about it and think about what that puzzle piece might be. We'll do so you can do some predicting and like the banana sinking or floating, we'll show you the answer at the end. And to me, these are the pieces of the puzzle that make up the heart that is our passion and how to inspire our students uh, with your passion. Well, let's begin with P for pace. So for each of these, we'll talk about what it is and why it's important. Pace to me means that you are well planned. You have your materials ready to go. They're at your fingertips so that you can maintain a fairly quick pace of class. And I know that that's difficult, especially now with technology and what technology can do to, do to the best laid plans. However, uh, as much as you can, the faster you move, the more engaged they stay. Even if you just think about um, students nowadays, they sit at home watching TikToks, which are really like five to 10 second videos. So their brains are wired for quick movement from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And when we slow way down, even though they, they do need some slow time, um, that's when their brains start to think about other things. So uh, you, when we have pace, we teach with a sort of urgency, like, oh, and this, and this, and this. And I think that even though uh, it's sometimes, it might sound like it's too quick, there's a balance point there where the pace is just right. And when it is, I think that really communicates to students that you care. It's like, it's like I care about this enough to, that we gotta keep rolling guys. We cannot get distracted. We cannot get off topic. It shows them that you think that this is important. What we're doing right now is important and we need to, um, we need to move on to the next thing because there's so much for you to learn. Now, of course, I'm not saying that you wouldn't stop and scaffold and do all the things you need to do to make students feel comfortable. Like I said, this is like that balance point in pace where it's just fast enough to keep everybody with you, but you've also got all of those scaffolded, scaffolding and modeling and, and gestures and things in place to make them able to do all of the uh, activities. Pace keeps students on task. When, uh, if you're teaching in the target language and you're using all kinds of things uh, like I was with manipulatives and things, students don't really have time to go off task. And so as a result, it supports class management, right? Because if you're not off task, you're not starting to think about what other behaviors they might wanna do. And uh, so your classes end up better managed. So I think, and, and when your classes are better managed, then you have a space where you can, um, communicate your passion for this language to students and allow them to learn as much as possible. So pace is the first part of our passion. Next is A for authenticity. Now, authenticity, firstly, let's talk about how it means just being real and genuine and your true self with the kids and uh, in front of the class. Why is this important? Because as you know, 
students, children recognize fake from a mile away. You know this even when you're not feeling well, even the tiniest bit and you think, oh, I'm just going to make it through this class. Kids have some kind of a sixth sense and they can tell and that might be the class where they choose to, to act up a little bit. Right. So they really know when you're being fake, even if it's even if it's for a good reason, but certainly when it's when you don't genuinely care about what you're doing or if you don't genuinely love the activity that you are giving to them, they're going to be able to tell. So you need to be real and genuine with the activities you choose to do with how you talk to them uh, and they really appreciate it and that starts to build relationships. Now in world languages, of course, we talk about another type of authenticity. And that's the authenticity of using real world language, right? The language they student, our students want to learn the language that is from the real world. It's about using real world texts. And, uh, and um, by that, I mean, of course, authentic texts, right? Authentic videos, authentic uh, infographics, authentic posters, authentic meal receipts anything you can show them that's actually from the real world of today. And finally, representing real world diverse cultures and images in our classes is important. It's an important component of authenticity. We want to show them that, the, that we know that, the, that in all of our languages, the real world of today is a diverse place. And even if, even if you teach a language that might not hold a lot of diversity within the target culture, showing them uh, images and videos where people from all over the world that are diverse are interacting with that culture also is important because it's important for our students to see themselves succeeding in that culture. So the more that you can show diverse images, like for example, make sure when you, even when you search for clip art and when you search for, for a photo of a home, make sure you don't always show the same type of home or the same type of, uh, or the same uh, type of clip art. Uh, so authenticity from being real and being genuine yourself to using authentic uh, real world language, real world texts, and, and diverse representations is another key component of helping students to start to feel passionate about both this class, because they start to love you, and this language and culture. They see where it's something more than just uh, an academic subject, and this language is something more than just something you as the teacher made up on the way to school or something that exists in a textbook. It is something tangible and real with which they can go out into the world and use in their careers and travel and to make friends and to talk online uh, when they're playing video games uh, and to understand anime and other movies they see in the language. That is what they wanna use it for. And that's what authenticity uh, in your classrooms starts to show them. P-A-S, okay. The first S is self-awareness. And self-awareness is, of course, it's, a, it's, it's knowing yourself, of course, as it says, right? The way we've always sort of thought of it. And it's knowing your strengths. So what are you good at? Are you good at singing in the class? And if not, it's okay to use a video to have song, things like that, right? Um, it's also knowing your biases so are, and, and investigating that for yourself. So you might not even realize that you have certain biases. Um, and so doing that work where you start to um, either go to trainings or do readings to start to investigate whether certain, you might be doing things in your class either, um, it could be anything, how you're instructing, which students you're calling on the most, how you're grading, there might be things influencing you that you don't even know about. And that's another key component of self-awareness. And once you become aware of it in yourself, you can become, you can also foster it in students. And this is actually a key part of the intercultural communication uh, can-do statements and intercultural competence. That notion of knowing your own self, unpacking assumptions you might have about others and other cultures, and then being able to cherish your own cultural identity and the cultural identities of those that you are in your classroom, in your community, and out in the world. So why is this important? You'll see my, my puzzle piece is messed up right now, but we're just going to ignore it because this is technology. 
because this is the foundation of authenticity. This breeds trust and builds relationships between you and your students and the classroom community. And this is key. Um, once students feel that trust and relationships with you, if they care about you, then they will care about this language and culture. Um, it also ensures that you're looking at everything with a lens of equity and inclusion. When you're thinking about instruction, when you're planning, when you're just choosing materials, if you've got a lot of self-awareness about your own strengths and your own biases, uh, then you'll apply it in those situations. And it builds feelings of safety in the classroom. Right? So students cannot learn in a classroom that doesn't feel safe for sharing. And especially in a language class where we want them to do a lot of sharing of their own cultural identity and their own assumptions about other cultures, um, it's essential that we have that feeling of safety. All right, that's the first S, P-A-S-S. -S. Self-care. How interesting that self-care shows up here, but basically we cannot, be the teachers we need to be in order to inspire passion in our students and to be passionate in the classroom every day if we are not taking care of ourselves, if we're not healthy enough to do it. So, and especially nowadays, right? It means that we're taking care of our health, we're getting outside, we're getting some exercise, whatever it takes for you to feel at your best, we, we're ta we are take care of our breath, right? So instead of, uh, in many situations, the best thing to do is to take a deep breath, like me right now, right? And then as you move forward, it's actually easier to do your teaching and your presenting. You need to make sure you have downtime for yourself and you need to get that rejuvenation, whatever it is for you, whether it's something spiritual, whether it's reading, whether it's meditating, whether it's jogging in a marathon, running in a marathon, um, that's what self-care is. And why is it important? Because you are important. Just like when you get on an airplane and they tell you to uh, put your mask on uh, before you try to help others, if you are not at your best, you cannot do what it takes in the classroom and you will not be able to communicate that passion to students. I suggest that you um, take a look at the articles I have linked to the last uh, four things we've, the last three, four things we've discussed, right? P-A-S-S. -S. And uh, I have a lot of great articles that will tell you more about each of these topics, including self-care. P-A-S-S-I. Let's talk about intensity. So what do I mean by the word intensity? If you look it up in the dictionary, you might see words like resolve or determination, or my personal favorite, this is one that pops up, your full and eager attention. So to me, what that means is, and, and you, you probably do it with your students and even with your own children, or even, and hopefully with your friends and, and family as well. When a child talks to you or a student talks to you, you literally let everything else fall away and you give them your absolute full attention. So especially if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you look right into their eyes, either down here if they're little or up here if they're taller than you, and you absolutely listen with all of your, uh, your presence there with them. And it's, it's very difficult in these online situations, I know, um, but it's, it's extremely important. And even if it means that you're giving your intense attention to a screen grid full of students, at least they can see you up close looking, you know, adjust your screen. I have about three books under mine so that I'm right straight looking at you versus being down here or up here. And it just lends more intensity to the conversation. Also, when you're teaching, beyond that, when you're teaching, it's that notion that you're fully present in the moment. So it's the thing that allowed me to hear that student make that tiny comment about the water so I could sprinkle them and kind of add to the fun. Or I often see in classrooms uh, when I'm observing a new teacher, for example, a student will be in the back of the room with her, his or her hand raised and the teacher doesn't notice because when you're a new teacher, there's just so many things to notice, right? And the student will often, in that moment, when the teacher doesn't call them, that's when they get discouraged. I'll say, oh, miss, she doesn't even call on me. She doesn't even care. 
they quickly go into that mode where they feel like this class is not for them. So as hard as it is to keep your eyes on everything and nowadays to keep your eyes on this and the chat and this, noticing when students need your help and being that intense that you're that with the class is, is very important. So you need to teach with it. You need to listen with intensity. You need to notice with intensity. You need to collaborate with intensity when you're collaborating with your colleagues on things. That's another important way. And then that's how you'll get the most out of it as well. And you need to plan with intensity. You need to think through, almost visualize exactly how things are gonna happen in your class. And actually the more you plan with it, the more you'll be able to do it when you're uh, actually with the students because you'll be all ready to go and you'll be ready to keep up that pace that we talked about earlier. It's important because it engages, right? When you've, if you've seen wonderful speakers on the stage who are extremely intense with their, or even presenters at Actful who are extremely intense and going around the room and really present with the audience, that inspires you as the listener. And that's how your students feel. And like everything we've been talking about today, that builds trust. It helps them know that you are with them and you are there for them. It communicates your reliability to them and how you're going to, you're the one they can come to if they need anything. And like we've been mentioning earlier too, it communicates that you value this language and culture so much and the learning of languages that you're willing to be all here now and you expect students to be as well. And that promotes their passion for the language and culture. And it avoids disruptions because the more aware you are of everything that's going on in the class, the more you can go stand by someone who you think might be about to disengage or the more you can uh, notice a problem that might be occurring. So we are already P-A-S-S-I. I, I do encourage you to uh, click on intensity and read the article about intensity there before we go on to the next one uh, here, because that uh, is actually, it's from Robert Marzano's The Art and Science of Teaching. And as you may know, um, Marzano has the, the um, compendium of instructional strategies that they've put together, and there's 43 of them. And actually the notion of demonstrating intensity and enthusiasm while teaching is number 29. It, is, it has been research proven to affect learning in a positive way. So you can look at that document and see the rubric they have there for to measure how intense and enthusiastic you are in the classroom. So please take a look on your handout. So I, O should be next. O is for openness. So what do we mean by openness? It means that you as a teacher are willing to listen to listen to students, to listen to colleagues, to listen for things that are new and, and different that you may not know about. You're willing to try new things. You're willing to learn new things. So why should this matter in terms of promoting, um, letting students know how passionate you are and promoting it, your language so that students become passionate about it? Well, it models vulnerability for students. So if, if there are times when students know something and you don't, and who knows what it might be about. It might be about the football game this weekend, or it might be about something uh, they read about the, the language or culture that you just hadn't heard yet. If you take in, in that moment, if you behave with openness and say, oh, you're kidding, oh, tell me all about it, right? Or maybe in your language, you would say that. Um, that models a vulnerability that's really important and does more to build that relationships and trust. It encourages students to try new things too. If they see you trying new things, then they're more likely to try new things in your class. You know, just saying, if I was in the classroom right now, I'd be all over that TikTok, trying to make up a TikTok to remember different Japanese vocabulary where you say a different word for every move. Um, those are the kinds of things that just crack them up and make them, um, encourage them to uh, come out of their shell and, and, and make mistakes like, like we want them to make when they're learning languages. And it ensures that you stay current. So if you're open, and I see that because you're at Actful, obviously you're open to learning new things and trying new things. Uh, and the more we can bring that into all as all, all year round um, by staying current, you can be on Twitter, you can and participate in things like LangChat. You can, there's been a number of wonderful um, co uh, virtual conferences this year and please be involved in your regional and state organizations. 
those things are the things that ensure that you stay current so that you can serve your students. Okay, I think we're to the last letter. N is for nurturing. So what do I mean by nurturing? Well, that become, of course, we know it from sort of our the parenting literature, right? And if you click on the, um, the puzzle piece on your handout, you'll see that I have linked an article that is about nurturing parents and nurturing teachers, and they are very related. So what does it mean to think like a parent? Well, it means that in our classrooms, we're not just delivering information to the students. We're not just lecturing them. It's more like we're coaching them. We're supporting them in learning this language. We're the one that's holding, their, holding them as they try to swim for the first time. Or we're, we're going to throw them the baseball in, in a little bit softer way so that they don't get hit in the face the first time we try to teach it to them. We're the nurture. We're, we're, in that way, we're very much nurturing like parents. And if a student doesn't know how, you'll, you saw in my lesson, if they don't know a word, give them a few choices. If they uh, want to be able to speak at the sentence level, but they don't have everything to do it yet, give them a sentence frame or give them a sentence starter, give them a hint if they don't know an answer. It's a, it's a way of thinking about teaching that means you always want them to have success. We're not there to make them fail. We're not there because to um, you know, if they get a bad grade, we're not there to scold them about it. We're there to say, how can I help you get better? What do you need to, what can I do to support you in, in this learning? So we scaffold, that means that we're scaffolding. We're thinking about how, what, how do I build these experiences so that students can be successful along the way until I take those scaffolds away. And even when the scaffolds are gone, you gotta be ready to run back and put them back in so that they can always feel success in the language. That's, the, that's how students fall in love with it, stay in it, and then have the skills they need to move on to the highest levels when it gets really, really difficult and they're much more on their own. You need to use praise in ways that are, um, that are constructive and also that are giving. Um, praise is free for you to give. So feel free to give it as much as you want, whenever you want. And feel free to give it in ways that are also proficiency, pushing their proficiency, right? So do it in the target language. Use a follow-up uh, question with your praise, right? So instead of just saying, good job, say, oh, you, you said you like mangoes? I like mangoes too. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow, we're the same. That's also a form of praise is to, is to give them something back to them that shows that you understood and that you appreciate their opinion. Why is this important? Again, it builds trust. It builds comfort in the classroom. It builds, frankly, love. It builds a loving environment in the classroom in which students can fall in love with the language and culture. Because ultimately, how students feel about you is how they feel about learning languages, at least for the year you've got them, right? Or the years you've got them. So I wonder, now that we've talked about P-A-S-S-I-O-N and ended with this particular sentiment, what do you think is this last puzzle piece that's right at the center, that's a large part of communicating passion to your students and building that passion for languages in your students? Hmm, maybe the Simuli people wanna put an idea in the chat and then I'll show it. Well, it's you. There is nothing more important in that classroom than you. You are the person that, that for this period of time you have the students, absolutely controls the way they're gonna feel about this language and culture and ultimately how, whether they're gonna go on and continue it and whether they're gonna fall in love with it. And everything that you do from your planning to your choice of materials, to your intensity with which you teach, uh, to the pace at which you, which you teach, to how you take care of yourself, to how you uh, foster self-awareness in yourself and in your students, all of that, how you nurture them is all about you. You are important. And so I do hope that you'll take care of you at all times. You inspire, you engage, you encourage. You are the reason that they will love learning languages. 
And I'd like to come to the end of our session here with this quote. This is by Maya Angelou. As uh, some of you may know, she spoke at Actful a number of years ago and I was lucky enough to see her. And uh, her voice was so one of a kind and spectacular that uh, I don't think I can do it justice. So I'm going to move myself over here and we'll just be quiet for a second and read it together. Isn't that just wonderful? So I encourage you to return to the questions that we started at the beginning with. Why did you become a language teacher? Why do you love the language and culture you teach? Why do you believe language learning is important? And how do we communicate our passion for languages and for language learning to our students? And how do we help students to love this language and language learning in general? And I hope that today you have decided that some of the ways that we can do that are with pace, authenticity, self-awareness, self-care, intensity, openness, nurturing, and most importantly, you. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And now uh, I will leave time for the uh, live chat feature. And if you're Simulive, uh, you can join us there. And if you're not live, I'd like to say thank you. And I hope to see you soon or, uh, or on Twitter. And please stay safe, stay well, take care of yourselves. And may, I'm hoping we can see each other in person next year.